Here are six interview questions patterns that I make sure to review before I apply to any job. One, the two-pointer approach. I know that in school you learned that the pointers are a reference to something a memory address, but in this case they don't necessarily have to be. The idea for the two pointers is to iterate two different parts of an array simultaneously to get the answer faster. So in our case, instead of referring to specifically memory address pointers, what we do is just have two indices that move around an array or a string at either at different speeds or in different positions. That's where the name two pointers comes from. There are primarily two ways of implementing the two pointer approach. One pointer at each end, and we start one pointer at each end and then walk them towards each other, like we can see in this diagram over here. We have one pointer at the beginning and one pointer at the end, and we start moving them towards each other. And you also have a second way of doing it, which is at different paces. You start both items at the same position in an array, and then you move them towards the same direction, but just at different speeds. So. How does this save time um, and space? Well, there are a lot of situations where a naive implementation requires you to actually store a lot more data or you need to traverse a specific item multiple times. But with this, you're kind of shortening the time that you need to run based on different conditions. So as I mentioned for the first approach, we can use this to determine if a string is a palindrome instead of me having to reverse a string and then compare it to see if it's the exact same item as the other string, what I can do is to start two pointers, one at the beginning, one at the end, and go comparing if the items are the same. At any point, if they're not the same, I just break, exit, and I know that it's not a palindrome. I can also use that same approach to find two values or two integers in an array that add up to a specific item given that the array is sorted, right? Like if my array is sorted and I want to find two items that add up to a specific value, I can start one pointer at the beginning, one pointer at the end, and if the sum that I'm looking for is greater than the one that I'm currently have with my two items, I can increase the left pointer one item because I know that it's sorted, so that will increase my sum. And if the sum that I'm targeting is actually less than what I currently have, I would just decrease the left item um, because that will actually bring my sum down to what I'm trying to find. So that's the first approach. And the second approach is to have two pointers going in the same direction, just at different speeds. Um, you'll find this as the tortoise and the hare, I'm just gonna call it turtle and the bunny algorithm, where you can find if a linked list has a cycle in it. By using two pointers, you just move one fast and the other one slow. You can catch if at any point they meet and you can determine if you have a cycle on a linked list, or you can actually use this to find the middle of of a linked list. Pattern number two. For pattern number two, we have the sliding window pattern. In this scenario, we use it to solve problems typically involving arrays or linked lists or strings when we're talking about like contiguous subarrays or contiguous substrings. This is a common scenario where the sliding window pattern becomes highly, highly useful. So in the sliding window pattern, we see something similar to the two-pointer approach, but instead of just having two points or two items that we're looking at, we typically have a window of items that we're evaluating. So as in this diagram, we can see that it, it, it looks like a sliding window, right? Like we start with a specific size of items that we wanna do or we wanna evaluate. We evaluate them with whatever conditions we need, whether that's a sum, an average, or whatever. And then we move them one item or a couple of items to the right. Like we start sliding that window as we go. In this scenario, the sliding window pattern does have one fixed size. This is going to be one, two, three, four, five items, but it doesn't have to have just a fixed size. In a lot of cases, you'll see that the sliding window needs to grow and shrink dynamically. Like it might start and just grow one, then two, and then shrink and just keep one and then keep going and then shrink again and so on. So it'll start, um, it doesn't necessarily have to have the specific size all the time and just move to the side. It can move as it shrinks and grows at the same time. So you'll, you'll see that um, in a lot of patterns. This is very, very useful when we need to do, again, things with substrings or subarrays. This is so, so important. And I find myself applying this a lot more than, than I thought I would. So very, very important when I'm preparing for my interviews. Pattern number three. For pattern number three, we have breadth first search. So breadth first search is a fundamental graph traversal algorithm. So you'll see it a lot in things like graphs or trees, depending on what you're doing, although a tree can be a graph if you actually think about it. 
about it. But okay, so a BFS or breadth first search explores a graph level by level, starting from a given source node and visiting all of its neighbors before moving on to their neighbors, right? So this ensures that the shortest path to each node is found first before doing anything else. So if we look at this diagram over here, we can see what, what breadth first search is doing. This is very, very useful when we're doing things like level order traversal. As we can see, we start at the first node that would be the root of my tree. And as I go down, I first evaluate this item, then their neighbors. And I do that before I evaluate the neighbors of those items. So I'm kind of going level by level because I evaluate this, then these two, then I evaluate these three, and lastly, the, the you know, the bottom two over here. So very, very useful when we need to traverse a tree level by level and either do a level order traversal and print them or actually get the value. Like we might need to calculate the average of each of the items or each of the levels in my tree, which is very, very useful for this. Pattern number four. For pattern number four, we have depth first search. So depth first search is very, very similar to our breadth first search where it works on graphs and trees. And this is a very fun fundamental graph traversal algorithm used in various applications, especially during software engineering interviews, using DFS can give you a significant edge on solving complex problems. So DFS explores a graph by going as deep as possible along each branch before backtracking. This ensures that all nodes are visited by diving into the depth of the graph or tree structure. So as we saw before for the breadth first search that actually traverses level by level, our depth first search decides to go deep first before exploring all of the neighbors. So we typically pick the left child to go down through, but I don't, I don't think it really matters. But if you start with the left, you'd have something like this. We visit the first node, number one, then we go to two, then four, then seven. And over here, we don't have anything else to go down off. So we start backtracking. Okay, here we look at this one, then we continue backtracking. We look at this one, this one, and last the eight. So very similar to my depth first search, but in this one, we just go deep onto the graph or the tree instead of going wide. And just as a side note, typically you will implement BFS or breadth first search with a queue and DFS with a stack. So you can do either a stack or recursion where you're just leveraging the call stack to do whatever you need to do. Think in your mind, breadth first search, queue, depth first search, stack. I don't know, it helps me to remember how to actually implement them and how to use them on an interview. Pattern number five. This is actually a data structure, but it's also very, very useful as a pattern. A hash map, also known as a hash table in some places, is a data structure that implements an associative array, a structure that can map keys to values. It uses some hash function to compute an index into the array and buckets and so on. Um, you're probably familiar with what a hash map is. But the good thing about this is that we can use it as a pattern. In a lot of cases, you will need to leverage a hash map to either count the frequency of items, make sure that you only have one single item in an array, etc., etc. This has so many good benefits as lookup being 01, average case, insertion being 01, average case, deletion being 01, average case. I say average case because if your hash function sucks or your hash tables are full or you have a lot of data, then you might have collisions and whatnot. But on an average case, we can assume on the average case, on the average case, we can assume that you have O of one or constant time for read, write and delete. Some common use cases of hash maps as a pattern is caching. Like let's say that you need to store the results of an expensive function calls to improve performance. So if you need to actually go to the database a bunch of times to fetch the exact same records, you might just be able to cache the specific record that you need instead of fetching it every single time in a loop. It also helps with counting frequencies. It's very, very efficient and counting the occurrences of elements. For example, how many words appear in a text, how many times a specific item is repeated, or if you've seen something before and um, 
in the frequency count. And it also helps with fast lookup tables. If you're stored in data and you need to retrieve it fast, storing it in a hash map is probably one of the best bets. If you store it in an array and you don't have the specific index for that, you potentially have to traverse the whole array just to find what you need. But in a hash map, you can do that by just giving it the key and it right away gives you your item without having to traverse the whole um, hash map. And if you're not familiar, this is pretty much what it does. You give it a key, it runs it through some hash function and store set and pretty much an array. At the end of the day, everything is just a glorified array with some syntax and stuff on top of it. But basically it runs through a hash function and it stores it into different buckets. So it knows where to store my data so that it knows how to retrieve it easily the next time that I need. And for pattern number six, we have top K elements. The idea behind this pattern is to maintain a heap of size K while iterating through the list of elements. The type of heap, either a mean heap or a max heap, depends on the problem at hand. For instance, if we want to find the top K largest elements, we use a mean heap. For the top K smallest elements, we use a max heap. So for example, the priority queue, if you're familiar with Java, the priority queue is part of the Java collections framework. This class is implemented as a priority heap. A priority heap is a special type of data structure that performs operations based on the priority of elements. So in a priority queue, elements are ordered either in natural order or by a comparator provided at queue construction time, right? Like if we wanna keep certain priority, let's say that we continue to get items, we try to keep the items that we use the most at the top because well, they, they have a better priority. So in a lot of times you might need to not just have a messaging queue, but you might need to have those messages be priority, right? Let's say that you have an inbox of different messages that come on and that that's your queue, right? But if you have some more important messages that you wanna make sure that you're reviewing before every other message that has come before, you might wanna use something like a priority queue to try and determine that. You don't want your message to be at the end of a long list of other items that need to be processed first, given that this has a bigger priority. So for example, in this case, we declare a priority heap and we add some items. We add them in this order, 750, 500, 900, and 100. But as we actually print those items or get them, we see that they were ordered and um, ascending order because that's just the natural order of these numbers unless you would have put them differently. But um, it just tries to naturally order the items, giving you that priority that you're, that you're trying to get. Let's assume that those numbers are just how important the specific item is. And you can do a couple of things with the heap, like insertion, deletion, and peeking to see what item it is. This is very, very useful when we need to do, for example, this problem, the top K numbers. Giving an unsorted array of numbers, find the K largest number in it. So here we have 3, 1, 5, 12, 2, 11, and K3. It's asking for the K largest numbers in this array. So if we look at this, the three largest numbers of the array would be 5, 12, 11, and we can confirm here that 5, 12, 11 because the other ones are 3, 1, 2. So by using the top K elements, you can easily do this given that you don't have an array that is sorted. And that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for sticking around and looking at the different patterns that I try to review to make sure that I can complete these elite code style questions and actually get a job and pass my, my technical interviews. So keep coding, stay curious. If you like this, make sure to subscribe to the channel. It actually helps a lot and it'll help other developers find this as well and prepare for the technical interviews. Thank you very much. Keep learning and stay curious.